Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. What are you working on now? Welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for this. This number six of the 88 Films Italian Collection. This is A Blade in the Dark. According to the 88 Films website, let's see what it says in the blurb. It says, A Blade in the Dark stars Andrea Ocifanti. That's probably not pronounced right. Annie Papa. A Fiboli Toledo and directed by Lamberto Bava. It goes on to say, Lamberto Bava may be best known for the lunatic lacerations of his demon franchise, but A Blade in the Dark is arguably his most terrifying offering to date. 
A Jalo Blood Opera, which features some of the most gruelling sequences in the genre's vast canon, A Blade in the Dark holds up a talented composer in a spacious Tuscany retreat. Unfortunately, a maniac is prowling the immediate environment and no one, including our heroic musician, is safe from this hack-happy psychopath's collection of dangerously sharp weapons. Co-starring the leg legendary Michelle Suave, later the director of Stage Fright in the Church, and written by the equally iconic twosome of Dardano Ecce and Eliza Brejanti, um, of Zombie, Flesh Eaters and the Beyond fame, A Blade in the Dark is one of the finest gore epics from the ha halcyon days of the Italian horror madness. Now, the Blu-ray, let's just do the specs, get that out of the way right now. Um, so the Blu-ray features um, a, a brand new HD master, uncompressed English soundtrack and uncompressed Italian soundtrack with English subtitles. Um, interview with the cinematographer, uh, Gia Lorenzi Battaglia, um, an archive Q&A with L Lamberto Bava moderated by Cal Model, uh, Italian opening credits and Italian closing credits, a reversible sleeve with the Italian art where you get with all of them, and the collector's poster art postcard which you get with all these releases as well. So just like it says there, the, the plot features this um, composer who has been asked to work on a brand new horror project to supply the music, the soundtrack, the scoring for that movie. And instead of uh, you know going into the studio and get it done, this man decides that a bit of solitude is the way forward. He books himself his own retreat, a villa in Tuscany, up in the hills, uh, to work on the scoring of the movie. But that's just the beginning of his troubles as pretty much everyone who begins to visit him uh, from neighbours and, and people of the surrounding area and people he knows um, start to die in fairly violent ways in fact overtly violent ways also he has trouble getting people to believe that maybe there's a psychopathic killer on the loose uh, his girlfriend, who is an actress, who comes to visit him a few times, basically shuns everything he says until, unfortunately, it is too late for her. She dies in a pretty satisfying, gruesome, gruesome death um, towards the end of the movie. Now, I was very much of the opinion, I'd said it on the previous recording, that I had seen this movie before. And it turns out I had not. I was totally getting this muddled up with Bava's previous entry, which um, is Macab. I would have put down cold hard cash. This is what happens over time when you watch so many horror movies. Um, you start to get things muddled up in your head. So yeah, I, I was convinced I'd seen A Blade in the Dark before and within the first five minutes of this movie, I knew straight away I'd never seen this before. Um, if Richard Gr Glenn Schmidt of Hello This Is A Doom Show is listening, my eyes rolled and I let out an audible groan in the first shot of this movie when Bob appeared. I was like, oh no, not Bob. But thankfully Bob has no speaking role in this one. Uh, Bob being the, the same little child actor who played a character called Bob in House by the Cemetery by Fulci. Uh, which there's a long-standing joke about how annoying that character is and seeing his little face appears like, oh no, don't do this to me, do not do this to me. And at that point I knew I had not seen this movie before and uh, doing a bit of research online, turns out I had this one completely muddled up with Macabre. So this was a, a first time watch for your, your reviewer here and to see I was excited to sit down and as soon as that you know that kind of wave hit me of oh I've never seen this one before I got kind of giddy because it's Lamberto Bava and I've got a lot of time for him as a director but also it's a you know it's kind of it's an 80s giallo which there's some pretty good ones out there there's mostly pretty bad ones out there this is coming a year after Tenebrae um, so you know I'm, I'm kind of excited about that and plus Bava 
does what you know Argento and his father did as well in that they they kind of they upskill and carry over a lot of people that will go on to great importance within the genre. So um, Michelle Suave is in this movie here. He's a kind of long time collaborator. He's assistant director on the project as well as uh, spoiler alert, the killer in this movie. Um, but you know he would go on and have a fantastic career doing things like stage fright, doing the church, uh, the sect, cemetery man. So you know he's a pretty formidable director until he kind of disappeared into obscurity in the, the mid nineties. But seeing him in this project just remind me of you know Suave worked with Argento, but Lamberto Bava also worked uh, doing assistant stuff for Argento just like Argento and his well Bava Senior had worked on projects together so it really does remind you that there was this fantastic talent pool of directors and you know uh, filmmakers all just working together in this this kind of loving circle of family in Italy just all working on these really cool projects and giving each other the opportunity to learn the business um, on set and then ultimately these people going on to do their own things so yeah I I, I was quite excited about that specifically when yeah, Suave appeared I think in like, the first 10 minutes of this movie I was like this is going to be pretty cool um, there are things that I want to discuss as positives to this movie quite a few actually because I truth be told I dug this movie a lot um, there's a couple of negatives that we will have to touch on because uh, I've got to be fair and yeah there's a couple of things in this movie that are not done well and yeah th then I think we we can maybe talk about the, the special features which are on this one like the previous disc I think at this point 88 films have kind of found their stride on additional content out with here look at the trailer and look at the trailer for some other releases we're doing not really a great special feature and this one, you're getting a, a great interview with the cinematographer, uh, as well as the kind of just under an hour Q and A with um, Lamberto Bava, which is fascinating. It's a really, really good one. The only kind of negative aspect to have in terms of that one is that Bava does pretty much his entire Q and A in English, and whilst his English is good, um, it's not always totally clear what he's saying um, and unfortunately there's no, no one's taking the time to transcribe that or put subtitles on it. So some of his answers kind of wash over you. But with that, it is a fascinating interview with one of the icons of genre cinema um, in Italy. But right, let's let's sweep into stuff I loved about A Blade in the Dark. Uh, well, the first thing is the actual plot itself is kind of cool. I love this idea of you know a film happening within a film, so you need not imagine too much that it was a stretch that this director would go on and do demons. I think this is almost like a prototype demons in this movie here. He's starting to experiment with with ideas of setting movies within movies. The fact he is scoring a movie, uh, a horror movie nonetheless, and he's taking the time to go away and work on, you know, on things in solitude and the, the mystery starts to unravel around him as to whether or not it's connected necessarily with the movie he is doing the work on or is it happening in real life? Is he getting too absorbed by it? A great modern example of that would be Barbarian Sim Studio, uh, the Peter Strickland movie, which I adore for that very reason about this idea of working on a project, specifically scoring a movie of a similar time period and then realising that the fabrics of reality and the movie might actually be thinner than you expect and kind of being absorbed by it. So yeah, I, I thought that aspect was pretty phenomenal. I love the setting of the villa as well. This movie mostly is set during the day, which is a ballsy fucking move for not only a giallo, but a ballsy move in horror in general. Anything that has the kind of slash and stalk mentality 
those movies benefit from having the dark. Um, this movie is, you know, mostly mostly daytime shots. Uh, m most of the iconic shots are in light, bright rooms, which kind of evokes memories of um, White of the Eye, the Donald Camell movie, which came several years later. This idea of wide open spaces, white walls, you know, um, shots of the daylight, you know, outside. Uh, with the killing sequences as well. I think that is a ballsy move and it's so against the grain of Jalo up to this point. You only have to think of the previous year, one of the, the definitive kind of modern 80s Jalos is made in um, Argento's Tenebrae, which is a movie I fucking adore. Um, Argento uses a couple of daytime kills in that movie. It kind of moves away from the... the, the the, I was going to say the crutch that he leaned on quite a lot to do with colouring um, and you get some daytime kills, some beautiful white walls and all the rest but for the most part some of the most iconic kills in that movie happen at night uh, this movie, most of the iconic kills happen during the day um, outside or in very well lit rooms which like I say is a ballsy move speaking of violence <laughs> you know Tenebrae I, I submit to most people is one of the more violent Jalos ever made a blade in the dark might push that i think from the kind of opening kill of the the woman behind the chicken wire being stabbed and also kind of tormented and tortured by this box cutting knife right through to what i would argue is one of the more gruesome jello kills i've ever seen in my entire life which is set in the bathroom where our victim at first gets a knife driven through her hand while it's on a counter. Then while she's stuck there, unable to move, she gets a plastic bag put over her head to suffocate her. She then gets her head smashed off a sink um, and kind of, you know, held over a bathtub and she gets her throat slit. You know, that is pretty brutal and that scene is long. They hold on to that. It's about a five minute kill sequence and clean up, which... <laughs> You know, they, they talk about the the nuance of Jalo at the time is this, you know, the, the beauty of setting up the kill and, you know, the, the, the playfulness that, you know, the filmmakers will, will install leading up to the kill, which is usually pretty gruesome. In the case of this one, it's like, you know, it's like straight for the, it's straight for an elongated tantric money shot with no foreplay at all. And I, I kind of loved it. I, I was surprised by how brutal this movie actually is. How how much it goes for the jugular. Now, it's worth saying as well that this movie originally was supposed to be for TV. It was like a made-for-movie Italian four-part TV series, which, when given to the, the censorship board um, in Italy, they were like, no, this is far too violent. Uh, no, please take this away. And Bava was asked to kind of cut it and make sense of it into a film and as a result what you get is about an hour and 45 minutes of a giallo there is a bit of dead weight here which kind of comes into the negative aspects there's about two or three sections in this movie where and we're going to talk about the dubbing but specifically the dubbing and this kind of the the transition or exposition in the story really is like putting an anchor on this movie um, and it slows down the progress of a lot of what you're getting in it um, so we're getting this uh, kind of fantastic build up of uh, hysteria the, with a, a, a guy who is questioning what he is hearing uh, what he's seeing um, and even the kind of, he starts to think there's coded messages in his recording. So there's a little bit of something like, um, maybe even like the Palmas blowout kind of happening here as well, where you're like, is there something in the record? Have I recorded something I'm not supposed to? Um, so all that's kind of happening along as well. The dubbing is awful. And that's, you know, there's no way around that. The dubbing is absolutely horrendous. So much so that about 20 minutes into this movie I changed it to the, the Italian soundtrack with the subtitles because I couldn't do it 
Um, funnily enough, as with all these things, you do a little bit of research afterwards. I've got the you know the big books of Jallo, uh, so deadly, so perverse by our, our good buddy and former guest of this show, Troy Holworth, um, who goes on to say that he thinks it's probably the worst dubbing on any Jallo. I've, there's still a big black hole of them out there for me, Troy, but if you're saying that, I'm going to go with you. It is pretty horrendous and at times almost laughably off-putting. So I had to quickly switch away from that. Um, the mystery itself is kind of cool. I, I liked it. I did not guess the killer, which is unusual for me with Jallos, although I did guess the gender of the killer. It kind of goes out his way to have this woman running around in a red dress. Um, kind of hysterically doing the old, uh, you know, high-pitched squeaky voice, which doesn't sound feminine at all. And because we're seeing the dress but not the face, you start to think, why? When obviously we're trying to hide this face, but why are we doing so much prominence on this red or kind of red velvet-esque sort of dress? Why? Why are we spending so much time doing that? Obviously, it's going to be a gender switch. Um, in a lot of respects, you know, once again, it kind of evokes the kind of reveal of the killer um, in the story of the movie that we see specifically about being taunted, being like a, a woman inside a man's body to an extent. Kind of evoked memories of Tenebrae as well. So I don't know how much that had an influence on this project coming like a year before and being as big as Tenebrae was. Um, I don't know. But... I certainly thought, you know, it kept me guessing, and then when I got the reveal, I was like, this is this is kind of cool, this is kind of bitching. There's also other elements of this that I kind of love, and I think it's the attention to the setups, not only for the kill, but it's the false setups as well. There's a great sequence um, in a pool where one of our, our female characters, who will ultimately become a victim uh, later on by being like absolutely smashed about the place and stabbed and her throat slit, goes for a swim. And as she's swimming, we have this shot of the swimming pool, but from underneath. And we see the box cutting knife at the bottom of the pool. And this sequence goes on for quite a while. And she ultimately, you know, she dives down, picks up the knife. But it's set up in such a way that you think that she's going to die. Someone's going to kill her at that point. And it's this false setup which I think works really, really well in the movie. It, to me, doesn't slow things down like some of the other scenes in the movie. It, it's just this great false setup. So fair play to Bava for setting it up that way. I, I thought that was pretty clever. Like I say, the overall reveal of the killer surprised me. Um, the very end of the movie, the explanation of the killer is a bit crap and there's no getting away from that. I don't think we need it in the movie. I think once again, I hate to keep using Tenebrae as an example, but it was the year before. Just go with Tenebrae. Just do what they do in Tenebrae. End with, you know, like a maniacal scream or something. We don't need the kind of bird with a crystal plumage sit down explanation. Well, the killer was always a woman trapped inside a man's body and was triggered off by seeing the events of this movie which brought back the traumatic childhood. We don't need that. It doesn't need to be here. The audience doesn't need it either. It's the fucking 80s at this point. It goes bonkers as you like. We will follow you. We will follow you along with it. So yeah, I thought this, like, in terms of the way the movie is set up, I thought it may be slightly long in pace, could use with about 10 minutes trimmed out of it. That being said, I thought the mystery elements very, very, very cool. Loved the setting of the story. The soundtrack is fucking bitching. The DeAngelis brothers really bring it in this one. There's a great deal of kind of spooky atmosphere that builds up, but you know, it's a lot of, a lot of Jallos post Goblin is involvement with the red go for that goblin vibe. I don't think they do that at all. I don't think they go down the roads of a kind of a more traditional Morricone or you know kind of frizzy or Ortolioni either. What they do is they kind of add these layers of suspense and atmosphere and kind of trippy weirdness into their music which is less the kind of proggy or synthy side of things but at the same time have this kind of 
ethereal spacey sound, which I, I really dig. I think it adds so much to this movie, the scoring. Uh, Batilgia, I'm fairly sure that's how, how his name is not pronounced, the kind of the DP cinematographer of this movie, really brings this powerful visual eye. In the interview with him on the 88 Films disc, he talks about how much they were allowed to, like people on the set, were allowed to just really take the reins of what they wanted to do and push forward with it. So Bava certainly did the editing, but kind of gave free reign to his, his DP to to really go out and set things up the way that he wanted to, um, which I think is a great sign of maturity in a lot of respects from Bava so early on, is to understand that the people that he has and the positions that he has on set in the movie are are kind of experts and while he, he is still finding his voice so to speak within within filmmaking this being his second movie he will allow these people to do their job and you know come in and you know edit in a way which he likes towards the end like i say that to me shows a great sign of maturity and understanding that you find your voice through time you don't find your voice straight away so yeah i think that works really really well Negative aspects, like I said, dubbing, not great. A couple of scenes that could be cut out, but all in all, this is a really fucking good movie. I, I like how... I like how visceral it is. Um, I like how mean this movie is. I, it has a mean spirit to it that I can get behind, uh, whilst at the same time being very ballsy. You know, kind of early on in his career, bucking a lot of the trends and a lot of the staples of the genre. Um, and kind of going down what you would think would be more in line with something like a slasher style. I can understand why people lump this in as being a slasher, uh, mostly due to the fact that it's kind of siege based, one, mostly one setting, and um, you know that that a killer who is like stalking people. But you know that there's enough jolly elements in here, from my point of view, to certainly submit it as a, as a jalo and. I don't think I'm being too controversial by saying that either. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really, really good fun movie. I think it's a surprise to me that I hadn't seen it, but like I say, to me in the back of my head, Macabre was the one that I was thinking about. And I think it's not just Macabre I was thinking about. I've got Macabre muddled up as well. I think Macabre might be two films in my head joined together. Which is the exciting thing about doing this Italian collection series is that I really am starting to pick off movies within the you know the series or within that area of the world which I think I have seen and on paper I would probably argue I'd seen and it's only when you sit down and start going through them you go oh no I've never seen this movie never seen it before and then it's the excitement of getting to see something with fresh eyes and wondering whether or not it's going to be good or not I know that there's a lot of people out there that hold a blade in the dark. Um, in quite high regard and I am now one of them I join with you on this one uh, yeah it was it was really really good in terms of grades uh, it's a 4 out of 5 yeah I think this one is like really good it's a ton of fun to watch it's dark mean spirited really quite brutal um, and uncompromising in places in a way which makes me very very happy as the sick sadist I am